Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another Community Connections with Ryan Sire. Super excited today to have my friend and colleague, Cornelia Shipley, with me. Cornelia, how are you, my friend? I am good, Ryan. It's so good to see you. It is good to see you. And folks, before we went on air, we were both, we're going to talk a lot about leadership and human behavior today, but we were both commiserating about PhD work, right? Yes. Yes. I have two papers and I'm done. <sighs> well, good for you. Congratulations. I'm... Um, I'm, I'm in the world of dissertation that uh, it's, 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 it's a labyrinth, but uh, it's an endurance test, right? It is. It is. I, I know you're getting your PhD in leadership. I'm getting mine in metaphysics. And it's, uh, it's definitely an interesting journey for, for anybody who wants to, you know, you get your bachelor's degree and that's, that's one level of, you know, mental toughness. You go back and get a master's degree. That's a whole other conversation. But when you get into the realm of a PhD, you know, it really does challenge your critical thinking. And if you're not ready for that conversation, it's not something you, you want to be pursuing. <laughs> All right. My middle daughter told me the other day, she said, Dad, you know, I love a lot of stuff you do. She said, but with communications, that was undergrad for me. I did have an org leadership master's. But yeah, you, I said, yeah, you know, honestly, I wouldn't really wish this upon anybody. Now that you're in it, you don't have a choice, but uh, you don't know what you don't know. But Cornelia, I know you do so many different things and such a great background profile, but for our viewers, for our listeners, why don't you just introduce yourself uh, so they can get to know you better? Absolutely. So uh, I am the CEO of a company called 3C Consulting. We specialize in the retention and advancement of mission critical talent. So we help organizations in the Fortune 1000. And I'm always really careful to say that because there's lots of companies we think are in the Fortune 500 that are actually in the Fortune 1000. Um, so we work predominantly with the Fortune 1000 around their enterprise-wide leadership. So that's folks typically at the director level and above. Their high potential talent, um, which could be enterprise-wide from new hire up to the CEO. Um, and then critical to retain talent, which is typically either sales talent or specialized talent in the organization. And we work around issues around strategy, people strategy, culture strategy, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging strategy. And my team of about 20 and I have been doing this work uh, since 2006. So we've been at it for a while. Well, all right. So let me jump in there. Congratulations, first of all. And, and I'll tell you, um, in the midst of what I'm studying in my dissertation, while we were talking about it a moment ago, is why 50% of startup businesses make it past the five-year threshold and 50% do not. So you have done well, my friend. Very well on your team. So well, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. The numbers kind of go down as yeah. they go on, but you know, that's right on. And you know, now we're kind of putting the COVID twist on it too, right? That's right. That's right. People have to be agile in business and they also need to be fiscally responsible, right? I mean, most business owners who start businesses, most people who started a business or starting businesses now who are pivoting because they don't want to go back to work because they want they've enjoyed the flexibility of working from home, really haven't figured out their profitability model. And so when you, when you start a business, you've got to be, especially if you're a sole proprietorship, you've got to be thinking about what is the cost for you to live, right? That needs to be your salary. And then what is the cost to run the business? That's your operating cost. And then what's the profit you want the business to make? And you've got to have all three of those numbers plus some others, right? You're, if you're in a consumer business, you've got your cost of goods sold. You've got, you know, the cost of employees, cost of a facility if you're using those things. But you've got to in incorporate all of those pieces into your pricing model. And especially when people start, they haven't done that, which is why their business typically fails. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm listening to you because we'll have a lot of small business owners and business owners of all type, entrepreneurs. And coming out of the pandemic, you know, I know a lot of people going, oh, man, you know, I'm going to have to go back to work some. And they're grumbling and complaining. And then they're saying to people probably like you and me, well, you know, I wish I could, you know, work from home when I want to. I'm like, well, you know, I was in Florida last, I was in Florida for a couple of weeks, but I was pretty much working, but I had a different view. You know, I had stuff I had to get done. It's just the hours I chose to get them done. So that's the life of an entrepreneur, you know, and I think, yeah, I do think though, pivoting back and I'm going to even say repivoting and repivoting and repivoting, you know, we use the word pivot so much, but as businesses, as an expert, as businesses come back together, whatever that looks like, you know, when people start coming back in, 
Do you think that's going to help? Uh, you know, you spoke specialize, I say, like, you know, keeping talent, which is so important. Uh, how do you see this meshing? What's your prediction of people starting to get back together because they've been apart? And do you, do you see a people more of a hybrid model of working or being different business to business? What do you see? Yeah, I think, you know, what we're seeing with our clients, the conversations our clients are having is really about an integrated model, right? You're going to have to, I think, consumer consumer being the employee in this context, right? So, so in, employees are, are shopping for jobs, right? We've got a, a huge job market opening. And so if you really want to be able to retain talent, you have got to be providing a level of flexibility and a level of options that you haven't historically had to provide. And this excuse, and I, I'm saying it that way, I'm not gonna, you know, neither here nor there, but the excuse, that you can't work from home if you're a salaried employee um, for the last year and a half has gotten blown out of the water because everybody was working from home. So now organizationally, people have to sort through when do you need to work in person under what conditions and circumstances? And then the rest of it, you've gotta be okay with saying, you know, let's, let's add some flexibility to this. You know, one of the interesting things I thought was so fascinating during the pandemic, and our team didn't fall into it, uh, fortunately, was everybody shifted from in-person to Zoom, right? Everybody went immediately. And it was really funny because we historically, before the pandemic, did a lot of our coaching work. We do a lot of executive coaching. And all of our coaching work happened over the phone. Okay. And when the pandemic happened, people were like, well, can we meet on Zoom? We didn't meet on Zoom before. <laughs> so we don't need to meet on Zoom now. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you know, it's a question of using the tools we have when we need to. It's part of the reason why so many people had so much Zoom fatigue. And it was interesting because originally my, our clients were like, can we meet on Zoom? And I had some, I have some members of my team who only do coaching on Zoom. But it was interesting, the longer the pandemic lasted, the less and less they wanted to be on. They were like, thank you for having this be a phone call. Uh, right. So, so you've got to have the right balance, right? Any, too much of anything is not a good thing. Um, you know, you and I have worked from home for a long time. I, you know, we're, the, we're close in age. We were talking about that earlier. So we've, we've had a similar duration in, of, of time that we've been professionals. And in my 30 year career, I've only worked in an office four years. So I know what it takes to work from home. There are people who are incredibly isolated and who really do need to get back into some sort of socialization. There are other people who are like, this transformed my life and increased my productivity. I mean, we have a team that's working virtually. They don't want to bring the team back because the sales team like tripled their sales. Yep. Working, home, or working from home. So... There are all kinds of business factors that are going to go into people's decisions. I mean, I think, you know, what the CEO of Twitter said was amazing, right? He said, we're working from home indefinitely, right? Um, and that saves a huge amount of money for corporations, right? It, it, we're going to have to reimagine what historically was commercial space, right? Because so many organizations are not going to be bringing their full team back into the office. Yeah, I think that's fascinating because it's spot on now as we come up, you know, coming to the outside of the pandemic and how that's going to look. And I know a lot of people be fascinated with that because I've been talking to people and you know, depending on who you're talking to. Um, right. I agree with you, Cornelia. Um, you know, we're in a place where with your business, retaining talent is so important. It's important in every business. But now, you know, if you're an employee, if you're ever looking to make a move, you, you've got options. And you know, so a good company wants to make sure, you know, they're working with people like your company, Cornelia, to make sure we don't lose them. So I do agree with you. I think people are going to have to look at their most valuable commodity. You know, what is your hiring cost to go find somebody and replace a A-plus player? And in my career, if I could tell younger Ryan something, I would have said, let some of this stuff go. They do a darn good job for you. Let the th little small things go because to replace that person, I don't even know the dollar amount. You know, I mean, typically it costs six figures to replace a salaried employee. Yeah. 
And that's not, that's not even the full cost. That's typically the recruiting costs, right? Then you're talking about the cost on the, the remaining labor, those who were left behind have to pick up the slacks. There's, there's, you know, cost to the process and productivity of the organization. So it's a multi six figure cost for most people who are, are, are losing a person. It's not insignificant. And I mean, right, you've got to have the person you bring in. If you had a real strong trust level with the other person, you've got to develop that, you know, the chemistry, like on a sports team or any or other organization that doesn't happen overnight. Right. No, it doesn't. I mean, it changes the dynamic anytime, anytime we bring a new person on, on our team. And even when we're joining up from a project team perspective, we have to have a meeting to talk about who wants to do what. Right. Every time you bring a new person into your organization, onto your team, you need to be talking about opportunities for people to do cross-functional work, to do cross-functional training, to continue to grow and develop. And oftentimes leaders aren't having those kinds of conversations. They're saying, I hired this person for this job. This is the job they're going to do. Instead of saying, let's talk as a team now that we have this new person with this new set of skills um, and talk about how we want to integrate them into the team effectively and get everybody growing, developing and moving our business objectives forward. Yeah. And, you know, this applies, uh, and you probably agree with this to, you know, it's Fortune 1000, Fortune 100, 500, or a 10 person company. You know, you've, you've, it goes back to the right people in the right seats in the bus. But even before that, it's just having the right people. And people are going to say, well, you know, it's hard to find somebody right now, but it's hard for everybody to find somebody right now. So that makes it even more important. Go back to your, one of y'all's core things that I want to make sure our listeners and viewers here, keeping those people you have. Um, again, if I could go back in the time machine, um, I was good overall, but just nitpicked on certain things that it ultimately maybe I lost a person or two that were just ridiculous. Look, you know, as a younger person. So I tell people now, you know, there's just something you learn patience and flexibility. Um, I think you and I being right at the same age, you look at the generation ahead of us, they said, well, you got to come into the office. Everybody's wearing a suit and tie. I'm like, nope, <laughs> I did that for many years. I'm wearing this or a sports coat if I'm speaking. Or, you know, the generation behind us, they may value, and I'm not trying to put people in the box, the working from home more than the money or compensation. It, right. You know, and not only, not only that, but there's the whole notion of I hosted a, a closed door roundtable for six diversity chief diversity officers across, you know, one, one, one was from a $6 billion privately held company, right? So there was all kinds of folks in the room. And um, one of the things I shared with them was some recent Harvard Business Review data that said in, in their most recent study, they published this in April or May of this year, um, they did a study of people who were interviewing for jobs. And six, I think it was 60% of them exited the interview process because of something that was unattractive about the organization. And the point I was making to those diversity, equity, and inclusion officers was, this is the time in which if your culture isn't right as an organization, it's getting exposed in ways you're not necessarily prepared to handle. And it doesn't matter if you're a small organization of five people or a large organization of multi hundred thousand people working in your organization. If, if people searching for work right now have any sense that there's something off in the culture for what, from what they want and where, that, where and how they wanna be working and engaging, they are choosing to opt out. And so it's critically important that you're prepared for that and that you're managing your messaging accordingly. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And, and um, you know, we've just had, it's kind of, I don't want to say this the wrong way. I've got tons of friends with MBAs, but MBA of the 80s, if you will, morphed into what, you know, the little bit of the softer side of when I got my master's in org leadership or what I'm working my doctorate in saying, you know, just some top down approach of telling people what to do is, is it doesn't, you know, it may work in the military when you're making instant decisions. But it is, it is not what people want. They want to be part of something. And they always have. But um, some old school approach, I tell people, that's why your turnovers this way. You're not even allowing them to have a word or share their ideas. You're telling them what to do. And they're looking for jobs while you don't know what they're doing. And that's just in normal times, much less now. That's right. And the, the other piece of the reason that people are leaving is because they aren't connected to what they define as meaningful work. 
right? So it's not only that they want to have some control and some say, but they want to feel like what they're doing is meaningful to them. And so we have a client that we worked with to help them actually shift how they even position their recruiting. They're now talking to people about finding an opportunity that's a match for them. It's not even, it's like, are you good talent? Mm -hmm. If you're good talent, let's talk about what's the right, what's the right way for us to be integrating you into our organization that's going to move our agenda forward and be meaningful work for you. And yes, is it more work for their recruiting team? Sure. But is it getting them the result to fill the jobs that they need to fill? Also, yes. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a trade-off and you have to be prepared to make some really important decisions. I love that. I, you know, I'm a huge sports fan. And so, sometimes like, uh, you know, an NFL team will draft a person that's an athlete. Like they're, they're super great at what they do, but they don't know exactly where they're going to play them. But they know they're a fit. They're, the character's right. The speed's right, the fitness right, the discipline's right, and they're going to figure it out, but they're not going to take a pass on somebody that could. And, and I think that is where, we're, where, you know, you and I both would agree, where you're trying to pigeonhole somebody like that person can only do, you know, accounting or the old school bookkeeping. That's, that's what they do. Well, could they learn new things or could they be cross-trained? Right. I mean, could they learn something else? Yeah, yeah and I, a lot of people are starved for that. I mean, they want challenges they and they want that purpose, you said. I think that's so important, right? Yeah, that people want people want, in my opinion, to do what they love with people they love who have their brand of fun. Nice. I right. Love that. And and more often than not, you know, one of my mentors gave me a piece of that. Um, and and then it, it it was clear to me that adding your brand of fun was really important because that gets to culture. And if if people aren't able to work in ways that are supportive of their most productive self and if people are working in ways that they don't enjoy they're not going to stay exactly and so yes your corporate culture has to be clear about how you're defining fun as a corporation so that the employee can then determine is this a place i want to work or not well i mean i love it a hundred percent you and i could talk all day and i know you know with I, I just appreciate you carving out i know how busy you are and trying to get the time together because i want to have you back on but i want to make sure because you do so much from i don't know books and speaking and coaching and training how can people connect with you best absolutely so on linkedin facebook twitter and instagram I am at Cornelia Shipley. Um, and then our website is just www.3, the number three, the letter C, and then the word consulting. So that's 3CCONSULTING.com. And as we kind of close, Cornelia, um, tell people whether whatever they're doing, like, you know, in, in, in a two sentence, three sentence thing, like if they say, you know, we don't, we don't even know what to ask you or we might need help, but what, what might you uh, say to those people? You know what, you, you froze for a minute there, but I'm guessing you're asking me my final thoughts yeah, about final what? thoughts. Just your final thoughts to a business final owner. Out, yeah, final thoughts. Somebody's listening to the show. Yeah, so my final thoughts to a business owner would be, I think if you're, two things. One, hire for, for culture, train for skill. Um, and if you're an individual that's thinking about, you know, finding a new opportunity, make sure you're clear about what it means for you to do what you love. What is that thing that you love to do? And how are you defining your brand of fun? And then looking at organizations and opportunity through that lens so that you can make a right fit decision for yourself. Um, and the organization can make a right fit decision for themselves. So thank you, Ryan, for having me. This was super fun. Well, Cornelia, we could talk all day, and I look forward to seeing you in person. We're both in the Atlanta area, so we'll definitely do that. And thanks again for coming on the show as my guest. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. I'll see you all right. soon. All right. I'm going to close this out. Folks, you've been listening to another Community Connections with Ryan Sauer. Special guest today, Cornelia Shipley. Reach out to her for so many things we discussed on the show. And, folks, we will see you next time.